You're listening to Inside of You with Michael Rosenbaum. Ooh. Yeah. Hey, uh, how are you? Thanks for listening. Doing some late night DJ sets. Oh, yeah, there? man. Late <laughs> night DJing with y'all. <laughs> I'm losing my mind. I'm losing my mind. But that's cool because these conversations help me get my mind together. Good Hopefully save. we're going to, yeah, good save. We're going to dive into some stuff. And uh, I like when guests open up. Sam Witwer is here. Uh, he was on Smallville. He's done so much for the Star Wars universe. He's uh, he's done a lot of stuff. He was in The Mist. Did you see The Mist? I never saw Frank the Darabont's The Mist. I don't tell him I didn't see The Mist. Really good. Doesn't matter if you haven't seen it. I've seen it. Uh, so check that out. But uh, I want to say thank you for listening to the podcast. If you're here for Sam Whitwer, this is a little podcast. Uh, we have loyal listeners, and they listen because it's not celebrity shit. We really get to the nitty gritty. We talk about real stuff, and uh, I hope you'll enjoy it and you'll subscribe and tell your friends. The um, handles are at Inside You Podcast on Instagram, Facebook at Inside You Pod on the Twitter. Um, the Patron family go to Patreon.com/slash Inside You. They do wonders for the for the podcast. Uh, become a top tier uh, patron. I'll send you boxes of stuff, merch, and notes, and we do YouTube lives, and I give you shout outs, and it's just a big family. Join uh, inside uh, patreon.com slash inside you, and of course the inside you online store. Great stuff there. Tons of Smallville merch, autograph. Check it out, and also the Talkville podcast. You should check listen to that. You can yeah. hear me and Ryan talk about and and Tom Welling talk about Smallville. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> or the dog bar. But uh, exciting stuff. And um, please write a review. It really helps the show. Um, and uh, listen to the sponsors. Sometimes when I talk about sponsors, because it's sponsors I care about and believe in, and uh, they help uh, the show. So if you like a product, it only helps the show. And that's about it. Um, I'll be in... Uh, I'll be in, in Wales. I'll be in. I'll be in a lot of places. Just check out my Instagram, the Michael Rosenbaum, and uh, let's just do it. Let's just freaking get into it. Let's get inside of Sam Whitworth. It's my point of view. You're listening to Inside of You with Michael Rosenbaum. Inside of You with Michael Rosenbaum was not recorded in front of a live studio audience. You know, we finally have someone in here. No, we have someone in here who has a great voice. What are you talking about, Michael? You do you so <laughs> much voice. I'm so jealous what of you your you do, career. You do tons of voice. I don't do like... I yes, mean, you do. I mean, I did The Flash, and I've done some characters, but Star do, Wars, but you're do, in that world, There's dude. that, but did you know that, that you know, when I was, uh, was going to come on Smallville, I educated myself as to who you are and i remember feeling this this great sense of like god how do you get into voiceover how do you do that it was lucky i talked about it last night i had the whole justice league over that i recorded with for years yeah all the cast members except of course kevin conroy because he passed but we were doing a celebration for him so the whole cast came over andrea romano who's a big director who has directed since the 70s i've only worked with her once brilliant yeah she's the sweetest woman she's done everything she worked with kevin conroy from the first time he did batman That's through true. the end i mean she worked with him on hundreds and hundreds of episodes <sighs> and uh we had a really nice night and it was cool but was it a so it was it was a celebration for kevin so you it was like social and hanging out and yeah it was just like him. 10 people i ordered a bunch of food and we sat around we watched an old episode uh, we watched kevin's first episode that he ever did and then we <laughs> no watched way. a little justice league oh, and we just terrible. talked and hung out and had some laughs that's and talked terrible. about kevin people brought pictures of kevin it was, it was really nice but you know again uh, kevin what a voice he had i mean now you know. i think i i've never met the guy face to face but i met him on zoom over the lockdown i think you may have even been part of this sort of virtual con and he hung out a little bit longer to talk with me because it turns out we went to the same school. So I didn't know that. I didn't he know went he, to Juilliard. He was a Juilliard guy. So I didn't know that about him. Um, yeah. But uh, wow, that guy's terrific. You know, I, I went to see Mask of the Phantasm in the theater. That movie that no one went to see in the theater, but now is considered a classic Batman uh, animated film. Yeah. Oh, it was so good. You loved it. I loved it. It was on Christmas Day that me and my buddy went to see Mask of the Phantasm. It was so good. Have you ever seen that, Ryan? I think I saw it in the theater, but it was I was a child who did not quite get it. 
Didn't get it. Because it was, I think it was too young for like the adult themes of- Brian's uh, younger than we are, right? Yeah. Yeah. Brian's 32. Four. four. Yeah. So he's 11 years younger than you wow. and 16 years younger than me. Wow. He's my child. Old. And he has more <laughs> facial hair than I can ever grow. That's right. It's, it's really an impressive weird. beard you have. Thank you. Yeah. And he's Hispanic, half Hispanic, right? This is true. Yeah. I'm, I'm a quarter Hispanic, so. A quarter? Yeah. Well, what else are you? whole bunch of like european stuff like i completely Ashkenazi mix. jew yeah, yeah. that's what <laughs> I, I am just, like, anything that's I in europe that means <laughs> yeah everything is in europe and then and then uh like 25 percent of my genes says you know i did the dna test and stuff like that 25 percent of my genes are from spain so but uh you know what's cool about you know you came in the house and unlike many who come into my house they're like well you got a lot of toys and stuff uh, do you no but you do. Oh yes. You have a your your place is filled with the memorabilia same type of stuff. Except you have way more signed stuff, signed which stuff. makes me now go. I need to take advantage of when I bump into people. If you are a fan <laughs> of someone's and you see him at cons all the time, bring something if you want. Bring Just something. say, hey, would you mind signing my Evil Dead poster? See, Look at but, that. But but their thing is, is I think you have a way of saying that where they they would just go, well, yeah. Whereas I think I would ask for it, be like, "Hey, would you mind?" Th no, but you have a way. No, hey, I hey, would. I've got I an Evil Dead I poster. Can would. you just, Bruce? Can you sign it? Well, I always do. Like if I'm working with someone, I worked with Bruce. You know, Tom Holland and I became friends. He directed Fright Night. Uh, Jason Patrick from Lost Boys is a buddy of mine. I played hockey with Kiefer. Um, oh Oliver Hudson's dad is Kurt Russell. He said, "You want me to get him signed?" They're like, they're easy in. Sure. So I'll be like, yeah. Yeah. I'm like, so I don't feel too weird. Sometimes <laughs> I feel weird. I won't get into the Chevy hey, Chase story. by the way. Oh, God. Oh, my God. Don't do Did it. Did I tell you about it? Oh, no. Chevy what? Chase? Yeah, I heard that. Oh, boy. Oh, no. It, was, it made me sad. I mean, I'm already imagining what it is. He was one of my heroes, and it just wasn't a pleasant experience. That's like, so and shocking. I had met him before, and I was just like, but he's older, and I don't know. I just was expecting, like, you know, everybody was always said things like, you know, he's not that nice. He's not that. I'm like, no, Chevy's great. I love Chevy. He's a legend. Right. I, I defended him, and then all of a sudden I saw the dark side. The dark side. But, you know, Chevy but, Chase. you know, he's older, and he's got some issues. Yeah. So I'm, I don't, I don't hold it against him. Maybe he was having a bad day, right, Ryan? It's possible. It's possible. Yeah. Uh, really quick to steer towards signed memorabilia. Yeah. Because up there you have the Thing poster. I don't know if you have it on camera, but he's got the po the poster from the movie The Thing. Yes. And John Carpenter's. The, John Carpenter's The Thing, which is still one of the most shockingly great movies ever. Oh, man. And that poster was done overnight by Drew Struzan. That piece of art right there he, overnight he did in 24 hours because they needed it in 24 hours and he had to come up with a concept do this do that and execute on it and it's one of the most brilliant posters it is because it's so ambiguous but like dark yes well i've also noticed noticed that one hand is flexed like this and one hand is reaching for you it sort of it sort of suggests that the thing doesn't know it's the thing at that moment just like in the movie, that, that the copies, you you get the sense that the copies of the people are not aware that they're copies until a mouth springs out of their chest. You know, they're yeah, like, oh, you that's know? true. So one hand is like a victim. One hand is reaching for you. Yeah, I never noticed that. And I, I asked Drew, I'm like, why did you do that? He's like, I don't know. Just felt right. He didn't have time to think. I don't know you why know I did You know Drew? I do. You seen at cons? Yeah. Well, no, I I know him personally through Frank Darabont. Drew actually did a poster for Being Human uh, as a favor to me. And you were on that for a couple of years. Yeah. Uh yeah, I was that that Being Human was uh went 4 years and Drew <laughs> This is kind of funny. Since we I I would only say this on the Michael Rosenbaum podcast, but since we're talking <laughs> like about, you know, we say people say things on this that they just they should never say. So I think people just open up and uh, right. you know whatever. So so here's something that has never been publicly told. Um, Sci-fi at the time was trying to do a bunch of different stuff. Being Human was coming out with our third, third season, and the, the material was really strong. I felt like we didn't have as strong a second season, but our third season was really funny and really strong and really great. And all of our publicity budget was siphoned over to a new project they were doing. So there was no publicity, no publicity. So I, I said to the cast, I'm like, guys, I can get Drew to do this. He offered to do it for a fraction. He says, he says, you gotta pay me something because come on, I gotta keep the lights on. 
but I'll not charge you anything near what I charge this for a dude. poster for f- to paint a being human poster. And he'd already done a piece of art for me for free that was being human, just for, out of the goodness of his heart. I said, "Could you do a full poster?" He's like, "That he's like you have to understand the commitment." That How I much? Have to make. Let me guess. He gave you a discount. I'm guessing ten thousand. Uh, it was a little bit more than ten thousand. It was a lot less than thirty thousand. Twenty five thousand. It was twenty. Twenty thousand. Yeah. Did you ask the cast members to chip in? No, no. What I did was this. I said, cast members, if I gave you a bunch of Drewsters and posters, would you sign them? And they said, yes. I'm like, great. I'll sell those to make the money back, and that way we get we get a publicity piece for our season three. And Drew, who usually charges astronomical prices way, way, way higher than that, I said, Drew, would you do this? And he said, Yeah, okay, I'll do it for that. So he gave me the sweetheart price, you know, Jeez. and then spent weeks, weeks doing this. It was a great. I loved it. Loved it. Now, did you get your money back? Oh yes. So you sold them at cons. Yeah. And Still, people bought them. How many did you have? Uh, I can't remember. I have a few left. I sell them sell on them Etsy for? now. I, uh, like 80 bucks each. Like that. 80 bucks, that's it? So yeah. you just made copies? Yeah. Well, yeah, I made these uh, sort of prints, the really high quality prints, and the cast signed all of them. And I still sell these on Etsy and stuff. So I have, I have some left. So you're the one who paid all of it? I paid the 20000 yeah. And so have you made your money back? Yeah. You have? Yeah, yeah. That's ballsy and cool. Yeah, well, I had to come up with something. I'm like, we're just not pu- publicizing what's so far our best season. Did the uh, publicist or publicity department really like it and use it? Yeah, they did a little bit, but they were also, they didn't use it as much as I'd like because I think they were a little embarrassed <laughs> that, that the actor is paying yeah. his own money. Yeah, because you guys aren't doing shit. There was, dude, so I remember going into a meeting at, with Sci-Fi and, and we presented the poster and it was gorgeous. It was, it was legitimately gorgeous. And I remember the execs at Sci-Fi. They're like, "Well, you have to understand, Sam. I just want to. We want to open up the possibility that we use this photo shoot that we did for season three that we are really proud of. We're really proud of these photos." And I'm like, "These photos right here." They're like, "Yeah." Well, I put together that shoot too, guys, because I did. I organized a photo shoot because we didn't even have so much as a photo shoot. They really didn't. Invest they didn't do in anything. Us. So I pointed they at the photos. I'm like, I'm like, "You like those photos?" And they're like, "Yeah." And I'm like, "Well, I did that." That was something I organized with Jeez. the cast. And so I'm like, so this poster, you understand? I'm like, see these? I'm like, and I pulled over, open a few photos for them. I'm like, see these photos? Interesting how they're in the same position as in the poster. This is reference for the poster, guys. I put it together a photo shoot that doubled as reference to give to Drew so he could make the poster. So they are embarrassed again. Probably not the best move on my part. Maybe you shouldn't have said that. Because that were they? Were I they... said it with a smile. Uh, right. Yeah. <laughs> By the way, I got to ask. It's a Rosenbaum question. Sure, I always think. Sure. You know, my friend John Heater, name drop, uh, Napoleon Dynamite. He uh, he always. Gosh, you always want to know like what things cost or what people get paid or like. I'm like, yeah, because I'm interested. It's like cool because I know people get shined a lot. Right. Some people, you know, work really hard and and the networks. You know, you figure when you make to a, a certain you know status or you get a show that you're going to get paid well, but right. obviously we know that's not always not true always true and yeah. and i, I want I, I i would think sci-fi probably doesn't pay well well it's interesting sci-fi had a reputation uh and, a, and an earned reputation here i'm gonna i'm gonna boost them a little bit they had a reputation for being really great about renegotiations past season three or something like that right where they started really paying well and they had a really great reputation for that we were on the cusp of that but there was a strange snafu that happened on our show that caused snafu. us a, bizarre snafu basically okay. we were getting ready to to shoot season four and five back to back we were going to be renewed for two seasons not just one but two seasons because they liked the numbers i mean the, my ob- objection was guys if you, if you keep promoting the show you can grow the audience even bigger than what it is because we're we're delivering i think a really good show um and they were busy trying to make other shows and they actually, again, I had some people admit to me like, yes, part of uh, uh, the, the large part of your publicity budget is actually going to the budget of that show. <laughs> and I'm like, that's great. Terrific. Which caused me to, that's you know, what it always is. We were just talking about Tom yeah. and I about Smallville. It was such a success, but they're like, yeah, but all our other shows are bombing. So we need to take the money from Smallville's earnings and give it to these other which shows. Which is like, frustrating because you're like, just, it's you just could bullshit. have a bigger hit. You it's could bullshit. Have a, you could have a, because the, the, some, the, the math that was done was like, well, you guys found your audience. So now we're going to try to build other audiences for other shows. Be like, yes, but our audience could be twice as big if you guys just publicized us. Anyway, now here's where I'm going to give them credit. 
we were going to, everyone was going to sign the contracts for two seasons of being human four and five. Mm-hmm. And we were going to shoot it nonstop, kind of like what you guys have with Smallville. We we're going to shoot 26 episodes. 10 in months. A row. Yeah. Right. And we, which we, we were 13 episode orders. So we were like, oh boy, here goes. Um, and it was a, being human was only ever 16 to 18 hour days every day, you know? So it brutal. was a brutal show, show to do. But we, but as brutal as it was, we liked the story. The maniacs that we were working for, our producers and writers, were hilarious. And so if you wanted to be working for someone, you wanted to be working for them. Right. And if you're going to be trapped on set for 16 to 18 hours, you wanted the maniacs that we had for cast and crew. We, everyone you was love just a, them. Oh my God, I love those I people. I like that. All I of like them. That. That's important. So so you were exhausted, but you know, and you'd be, dude, and I played such a moody character. So I'd be sitting there brooding and my character is just brooding and I'm, and I'm, I'm <laughs> getting into this broody place and it's like our... You know, this one, this day was going to go 19 hours. So I'm sitting there and I'm in a bad mood. And then Sam Huntington comes and farts on my leg. And I'm like, I'm like, you know, it's not that he farted on my leg. His comedic timing on the fart and the placement of the fart. Did it vibrate on your leg? Yeah. I was like, I was like, I could feel that it went to my bone. My, you know, (laughs) that sounds like my kind of guy. And, 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 and at that point you're like, I can't be in a bad mood now. He just farted my bad mood away. Yeah, you know, <laughs> I, I understand. That's how I feel about farts. They, 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 they you can fart bad moods away. Yeah. This show is sponsored by BetterHelp. When you're at your best, you can do great things, but sometimes life gets you bogged down, and you may feel overwhelmed or like you're not showing up in the way you want to. Working with a therapist can help you get closer to the best version of you. Because when you feel empowered, you're more prepared to take on everything life throws at you. And who couldn't use a few better coping skills to be able to handle all of life's curveballs? Look, if you're thinking of giving therapy a try, BetterHelp is a great option. It's convenient, flexible, affordable, and entirely online. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist and switch therapist anytime for no additional charge. BetterHelp can help you be the best you possible. Try it today. If you want to live a more empowered life, therapy can get you there. Visit BetterHelp.com slash inside today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash inside. Inside of You is brought to you by Home Chef. Ryan, finally, there's a company out there who when I'm hungry and I want to make food, I don't have to spend hours in the kitchen or run to the grocery store to see if I got something right because I always mess up. And if you're like me, by the end of the day, you just want to not worry about what's for dinner. And that's where Home Chef comes in. Say goodbye to meal planning, recipe, and do stress. Last minute grocery store runs. Let Home Chef bring simple, delicious home cooked meals right to your door. Um. They've got variety, flavor. It's easy. Uh, it's it's amazing. And there's little to no cleanup with this stuff. Home Chef makes your nightly routine easier and more exciting with a wide selection of delicious meals that arrive at your doorstep in the form of fresh, perfectly pre-portioned ingredients and an easy-to-follow recipe card. With 30 unique and flavorful chef-curated meal options available each week, Home Chef ensures your taste buds will never get bored. Home Chef will recommend meals based on your selected preferences with plenty of menu options to fit any dietary needs. Looking to master the art of cooking? Check out the classic meal kit options complete with chef-written step-by-step instructions. Don't have time to cook, Ryan? Have a hot, delicious meal on the table and a snap with quick solutions like their 15-minute recipes, microwave meals, and oven-ready options that save you time and effort in the kitchen, plus clean up is a breeze have specific dietary needs explore carb and calorie conscious menu items customize your proteins or swap for vegetarian friendly options what i love about this is you're getting great service it's easy to do i've said this before i'm not putting myself down but if i can do it anyone can do it uh it's and it's delicious it's just these are good meals you have a variety of things and it's just better than spending so much money on all these apps to deliver food i'm spending endless amounts of money on this and you don't need to for a limited time only go to homechef.com slash inside for 75 percent off your first box again go to homechef.com slash inside for 75 percent off 
Yeah. So, so anyway, uh, we, we all felt very strongly about the show. Clearly, we all loved it. So we were going to do seasons four and five. And then an international finance partner, the day before the contracts were signed, fell out of the deal. So suddenly there's a whole chunk of the show that is not being paid for. Mark Stern, the head of sci-fi, and this is where I'm going to give sci-fi serious credit. He jumped to action, made universal by that chunk of the show. But because they weren't expecting to buy a chunk of a show, like a third of a show, it was sold for fire sale prices. So, so they couldn't give you raises. They couldn't give us the raises, and they legitimately couldn't. They had a really good reason not to. As and then far the as other, you know. Well, right, exactly. But then the other part of it is that our budget went down. So what happened was this. I remember Anna Fricky, the showrunner, she contacted a lot of us and goes, I remember she contacted me, and I know she contacted the other leads, and she said, what do you think, Sam, if we ended it on season four? Because we could ask them to end on our, you know, and she, she knew that there was a new regime coming for sci-fi and all kinds of stuff. She's like, with our budget going down, we can ask for favors from some of the department heads, but people are going to be taking pay cuts, and you can't ask people to do that for more than a year. And, and she goes, so we're going to lose those people. And then eventually, if we get a season five, it's going to be a lesser product. We're not going to have any money to do anything to bring in casting. So you said, let's just finish it on four. We, we all agreed that we're like, if we're going to have this show end, let's end, end it with the good version of our show. Let's right. end it on our steam because of this weird thing that happened with this international partner. So we decided and we, we, we asked sci-fi, can we end it on this season? Right. And they said, yes. But the only problem is they didn't tell the fans. So the fans were a little bit were blindsided. Bombed. But we at least had a whole season to to end our show. And I was very, I think we ended it very, very strongly. So sci-fi, I, I got to give them credit. Yeah. One, they saved the show. It would Good have just gone away. And then two, um, they let us end it on our own steam, which when does that ever happen? Never. I, like, I can count on like Never. one hand how many shows I've heard where people get to go, hey, can we end it Let's like this? Let's give an ending. Yeah. yeah. I've been on many shows that, it stopped abruptly. Um, let me ask you this. You were born in Illinois. Mm -hmm. uh, were you uh, the kind of kid that was like, were you just all over the place and like creative and and just like you knew that people knew this kid's going to be an entertainer. He's going to be an actor. Is it something you wanted to do since you were a kid? Where did you grow up? In Indiana. Indiana. Yeah. Right. So you were probably, we were probably in the same boat, I'm guessing, because no one knew what to do with us with me oh they uh, was that yeah. how you felt i was just annoying and and i i didn't i was just weird and and i i had a lot of energy and i had no focus and you know no one was taking me under their wing and saying let me, it's okay it was it was it was tough it was very tough for me growing up but what was it like for you did you have supportive parents were they they were supportive in some ways but imprinted some old school programming that was not necessarily helpful and i think you're going to relate to this because i'm seeing you talk about ah, i wasn't focused and i was you know you're, you're, even your body language seemed to suggest like ah, i was just like kind of a mess up i was a you swear yeah, on this show right? I didn't, so, yeah yeah, so yeah. i felt like i just didn't have any purpose right yeah yeah so so i you know with the lockdown and the global pandemic i have only now at my age reassessed whether i was the fuck up that i always believed i was because up throughout my whole life even you know up till like a couple of years ago i'm like i'm a fuck up i am an airhead i'm i'm fuck up whatever yeah yeah and yeah, then you, I, you are i'm no, a total no, fuck not up. at all total fuck up. total fuck up. Uh, but yeah but no i would describe myself the same way i'm like my grades were terrible terrible you know couldn't focus all that stuff parents didn't like you Parents were, were <laughs> very much like, they thought some of the things that I could do were cool, but I was not doing the one thing you're supposed to do. You're know, supposed to do grades and supposed to go to school and focus. And instead, I was this long haired, bearded kid who they. Bearded? Were, yeah. In high school? Yeah. You had a beard? So, you have to understand. I didn't start puberty until <laughs> I was like a senior. When some of your genes are Spanish, right? Put it up. Yep. Put it up. Oh, yep. It happens, man. You're thick. I had a thick beard at times sometimes i shaved it sometimes i did wow you had hair in your balls like at 12 didn't you yeah uh, thick sp spanish hair on the balls right another hair goes another high five so just just saying um so so i was you know i i looked like a fuck up i probably talked like well, i was swearing all the time and i was hanging out with a bunch of musician people who all you're in a band hair. i'm in a band plumber love plumber love plumber <laughs> love plumber, <laughs> love plumber. Love plumber which is a very respectable respectable name yeah but dude it's like no one 
no one knew what the hell to do with these kids. And, and they all assumed we were on drugs and stuff like that. We were weirdly enough, the most like chilled out. We didn't drink. We didn't smoke. Me we neither. didn't do drugs. We were just, all we wanted to do was huddle over a computer or play D and D or record music, play music out for, with our friends and stuff like that. And people all, you know, there were a lot of people that assumed that we were bad news. Now, funny enough, my high school, many of the teachers saw through it. They're like, no, these are great kids. And they treated us like that. That's unbelievable. Just fucking what, what great. a rarity. Yeah. So the parents have me tested for drugs all the time, right? Wow. But the the people at school were like, I mean, they would say shit to me like, you're gonna be fine. I'm like, what do you mean I'm gonna be fine? I'm like flunking out of this class. I'm been getting a D. They're like, that's not what you're for. And I'm like, what? What are you talking about? Not what you're here for. So so if you and I were born in Los Angeles. It would have taken people all of five seconds at an early age to know what we were supposed to be doing. And they would have sent us in that direction. Yeah. Think about that. Think about what you yeah, were just- Yeah, I was already, I was doing impressions. I was making people laugh. I was just all over the place. You're right. You're right about that. I feel like, you know, if we were born out here, that all that energy and the channels, oh, he's, this is a kid's an entertainer. He's, he's an, an actor. Entertainer. That's what he's supposed to do. And they would have been very clear on that, but put us in Indiana and in Illinois- even in the suburb of Chicago where I was at, where John Hughes is from, I still didn't have a sense for it. Now, thank God my high school had an incredible arts program and all kinds of activities. So I was applied hardcore to that stuff. So, so you did a lot of theater in high school. Yeah. But starting for when? Um, starting when, as soon as I got there, freshman year. I was totally, and you had no acting experience really? No, and I didn't take it seriously, but it was fun. And, and I was told, you know, the traditional wisdom is, well, that's all fun and games, but eventually you have to get a real job, doctor, lawyer, or whatever. You have to. Not you know. going to happen. You, never. No. Not with my grades. No, no way. No, no. So you know. So my whole life, I've had this this sort of subconscious belief that you know, like I never updated the file of, oh, you're a fuck up. Mm -hmm. And over the the lockdown, I was like, well, wait, let's break it down. Played D and D with my friends all the time. <laughs> Uh, was huddled over a computer doing weird technical experiments because you know the Amiga 500 could do some incredible things. Sounds you know. like weird science. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Try to create a girl, right? Mm -hmm. No, we didn't quite get that far, but <laughs> but uh, you know, was recording music and uh, playing with my band. Um, you know, was acting and uh, and also was playing a lot of video games. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, yeah, that that, all, that doesn't make a lot of sense. He's a fuck up. Be like, wait a second, playing video games. Well, I make video games now. D and D. Well, I make D and D books and, and stuff like that. Um, the acting thing. Oh yeah, I'm an actor. Uh, what about the weird technical computer stuff? Yeah, yeah, I do that now too. Although I'm under NDA, so I can't say what I do, but I do weird, bizarre stuff. Wow, that's kind of cutting things. edge stuff. And uh, the music thing. Oh yeah, I draw a paycheck from that as well. So it's like, wow, look wait at that. a second. And I'm, I started uh, during the lockdown. I'm like, maybe I was never a fuck up. Maybe it was like, oh, but why weren't your grades good? Be like, because try concentrating in class mm -hmm. when you discovered at 11 and 12 years old what you're supposed to be doing for the rest of your life all i could think about was getting home and recording that song or mussing around with the computer and i have the same know. thing it's like you know back then jerking off in a sock now <laughs> right jerk no that was a, it's the same <laughs> a more expensive song. A more that's expensive, right, that's right. yeah armani socks you <laughs> that's know right. um uh, no i get it um you know uh i remember things like I, I i i'm the best armpit farter in the world and my brother was pretty good too so i said hey they're, they're auditioning people for america's funniest videos at the mall and i made my parents take me out there and we did jingle bells with our armpits jingle this is, bell this, boom, 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 this this happened this, this yes took place? i auditioned and wow. we didn't get it but uh i remember going to st louis with my parents to a cardinals game a baseball game and I was a Mets fan. I hated the Cardinals, and they had it was Ozzy. They were doing an Ozzy Smith movie about Ozzy Smith, the shortstop for the Cardinals, and they were interviewing people outside. They're like, "Oh, this," and I go, "Oh, I, I gotta be in this." So I went up and I go, "Hey, I'm a big Ozzy Smith fan," and I'm like ten years old, and they go, "Hey, so what do you like about Ozzy?" And I go, "Oh, he's really smooth, and he's." And I just was making up because I wanted to be. I still have that video, the VHS tape. Oh they made God. it, and I got in. Oh my I got God. in that little thing. It was like three seconds long. Wow. It's me as a little wiener, and uh, you know, so these little things along the way, I look back. And just making jokes and I used to, I never was able to go out with my friends. My parents made me babysit my brother. 
So on Saturday nights, they'd go out and get drunk. I don't know. My mom got drunk. My dad wasn't a big drinker, but maybe he did. Maybe smoking pot. Maybe it was Coke. Yeah. Maybe it was Coke. Yeah. Uh, but I remember learning everything that happened in SNL, and they'd come home, and I'd go, well, I'm the church lady, and this is church chat. That's right. And I would do that, and I would do- Same here. Yeah, hey, that's the ticket. Me and my wife, Morgan Fairchild. Morgan Who Fairchild. Have, and I would do all the impressions. So I knew that there was something, but I didn't know what it was. You know what you were doing is you were practicing, dude. Maybe I was in- Yeah, No, but no, yeah. but in a very real sense, you were practicing. I remember talking to- uh, I, I, this crystallized in my brain when, when this friend of mine, you know, she was like, I want to be a voice actor, but she was always very irritated when I would break into some weird voice. And I'm like, what's interesting? Because my friends, a lot of them are actors. They never get irritated when I break into voice. They break into something similar and we're always imitating something or doing some sort of weird voice mm -hmm. or something like that. And I was like, wait a second. People who enjoy doing that well, they're doing it for fun, but you know what they're doing while they're doing it? They're, they're learning how their voice works. Right. They're they're sure. learning how to change their voice, their mouth, their articulators to create different types of sounds. So you were practicing, dude. Absolutely. I remember taking a dialects course in college and we had to go and give uh, you know, uh, a reading in different accents, different dialects. So first there was an Irish accent, then there was Scottish, and then there was, you know, and, and we do English and all these things. And we got to one and then I just, I got up there and I go, oh, Agent Sterling, you think you can dissect me with your blow little tool? You're so ambitious, aren't you? With you? And I started doing this Anthony Hopkins or whatever the hell it was, and I got a D on it. <laughs> <laughs> right. he's like he's like i didn't want you to do impressions we're doing <laughs> want you to do but i was always like i need to get things out i need right. to get things out so i get it i get it entirely yeah. this podcast is brought to you by dove men plus care guys do you get distracted during the day thinking about your underarm sweating or itching or emitting an odor oh. do those thoughts keep you from showing care when it counts new and improved Dove Men Plus Care Antiperspirant with 72 hour sweat and odor protection and one quarter moisturizing cream helps you forget about your underarm so you can be present for the moments that matter. Don't let underarm insecurities keep you at arm's distance from the ones you care about. Buy new and improved Dove Men Plus Care Antiperspirant wherever personal care products are sold. This message is sponsored by Discover. Did you know you could reduce the number of unwanted calls and emails with online privacy protection? The latest innovation from Discover. Discover will help regularly remove your personal info, like your name and address, from 10 popular people search websites that could sell your data. And they'll do it for free. Activate in the Discover app. See terms and learn more at discover.com slash online privacy protection. When did you know that I'm really good? When was it that moment? I had a teacher. Uh, her name was her name is Beth Barber. Beth and Barber, she, and she was the you know one of the drama people at the high school. Uh, and she she said to me on more than one occasion, she would take me aside and she goes, "Hey, listen, I want I want to talk to you about something." I'm like, "What? what? You know, I'm, just I'm like, attracted I'm to like, you." What? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I will do. Oh, thank God. All of my teachers were extremely appropriate in terms of because, because I got really close to them. We became like friends. Uh, I still Mrs. Contact Barr. These people. Mrs. Barr. Mrs. Was she, Barber. I wish she was. No, mine was Mrs. Barr, Mrs. Barr, science teacher. And I wish she got inappropriate. I see. She I see. was so hot. Yeah. And she was like, you know, I'm like, 15 years old and she's like 23 teaching and i'm like oh my god dream but That's i hope tough. she likes guys with no hair on their balls <laughs> like yeah. little wieners how do you bring that up how do you bring that up <laughs> anyway by uh, the way by the way there was this one that's what you think as a little kid you're like as a 15 16 year old boy your hormones are going nuts you're like oh my god oh my god she has boobs oh you're my god oh my god you're reminding Boner, keep you're, it down keep you're it down. reminding me of an intro that me and glenn howerton did with this producer we were sitting down we were trying to get this movie made right which never got made but you're still and friends I, with him yeah yeah you still I talk know, to him ex yeah he's, i went to school with him he's I like did one of my best friends in philadelphia oh, but go ahead. and i are have been close since we met when we were eight well no i was 18 he was like 20 he's a couple right. years older than me but i remember we were meeting with this producer and i don't know what we were thinking i mean well look the script was totally in, had a lot of inappropriate humor so we're like let's you know we're like let's make an impression and so this woman sits down at the table with us and we actually said the following and we'd had some conversations on the phone so she was aware we were goofy right so she sits down and 
I'm trying to think who's who opened this. Yeah. It like, so I, and I, she sits down and me and Glenn are kind of glare, like looking at her like, like this. And I said, and we said, <laughs> and I said, Hey, do you like big dick? And then Glenn goes, how about two tiny ones? And then we were just both like, <laughs> like nodding, giving us like, yeah, you want to have a threesome with two <laughs> tiny little dicks, tiny two little tiny wieners. little peepees. She laughed her ass off. We're like, okay, let's get to work and stuff like that. But it was, it was like, yeah. that was our way of breaking the ice, which would not fly today. No, it would fly today. This was like in but 2002. It's, it's a shame yeah. it wouldn't fly. It's, like, like, it's harmless. Well, it's totally, yeah. It's like, hey, you like big dicks? Yeah. How about two tiny ones? How about? Ah, <laughs> yeah. And and again, she because she had read the script, she was already on board with that kind of humor. We were right. like going nuts, you know. But I mean, obviously, like always sunny. I shot their second pilot. I was their camera operator. Oh my god. So we were all And they never put you in the series? They did once. I was trying to bang Rob. And it didn't succeed. I I was trying to I was trying to they were trying to get men to come to the party part big it's not nothing you know as they were like no gay stuff but you know and my character was like i get it no gay stuff got it yeah sure understood i'm gonna bang the shit out of you so That's so amazing. yeah that was my character um and then funny enough uh, so i'm trying to bang rob in the always sunny well i have a different relationship with rob in his mythic quest show um it's not it's quite the opposite wanted to bang him in one show i play his dad in another show so there you go you play his dad I play his dad so you have this teacher who's like, you got something, mm. all that stuff. And so she blew my mind. She said to me, she said to me, she goes, you know, I, you could have a career at this. I'm like, what? and I've like long, like, what, what do you mean? Um, she's like, no, 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 you, you, you have something you could, you could do this for a living. And I was like, that doesn't make any sense. Cause I'm in Chicago and it's not anything that my parents could imagine, you know? Right. But she said that several times. And then where my parents came in and they they deserve some credit is that out of desperation they ended up embracing what it is that i do because they were like well you got to go to college i'm like good luck with that my grades suck i barely graduated and they were like well then you're going to be auditioning for the drama uh department of various colleges and i'm like and one was juilliard and one was juilliard and that's what i got i into. mean out of all the ones you could pick the hardest one to get into what are the like, in brief, you don't have to get really into sure. it, but just like, what do you do for an audition? What do you have to do to get into Juilliard? Made it up. I, d I learned the audition. The, I learned the Shakespeare piece that morning. Made what do up. you mean you learned a Shakespeare piece that morning? I know. You memorized it. Oh, there was another. There was do you the, have that kind of memory where you could just memorize so fast? I think I used to. Not anymore. I'm an old man now. <laughs> how, like, no, but like how how long is this thing? Is it a monologue? Yeah, we were just talking the, about put monologues. Put out thy light, uh, Othello. Yeah. Yeah. And you did it impromptu almost. I was procrastinating. You weren't nervous. And Barbara helped me work on it that morning. She's like, get up, get the hell over to my office. We're going to work on this monologue. And I learned it right then. And we did it. And uh, I must have read it the day before. Um, how then, long is it? Five minutes? I can't remember. I don't know. Okay, anyway. Maybe two minutes? So you got, how many people Three? are you auditioning for? Uh, Michael Kahn was there, John Sticks, and I think Liz Smith. There were some of the founding members of the school were there. Do they were in Chicago, actually. Right, but do you have to, before you even audition, do you have to send something in? Yeah, like, you have to put in an a application. I don't know how the hell I got the, I mean, I think they, they audition like lots of people. And then there are 20 spots. And you went to New York? Uh, no, they they had a, they would go to San Francisco, New York, and Chicago to audition. And Los Angeles. They would and, go did to you first. think any chance that you're going to get in? No. 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 I showed up. I, everyone was all dressed up and looking great. And I showed up in like a trench coat and like long hair and looked like, I don't know. Well, this Whatever. Is like, yeah. It's like, what? I ripped jeans. And I was asleep when they posted the callbacks like on the floor and they're like posted the callbacks and they're like oh we're calling back so and so and so and so and i thought i heard my name and i'm like what the fuck and i go up and I'm like you mean like sam what were they? yeah okay and then i left i just didn't i didn't take it seriously and when did you get a call it was uh went did the callback and then it was maybe a week or two later that i was called into the student activities office at high school and there and it was juilliard on the phone waiting for me to talk and, now how much does it cost to go to juilliard i you know a, way too fucking much how did you do point. it at that point my parents again uh with the whole north shore chicago thing could could pay for it but i i think i gave them a half off 
with Juilliard because I got kicked out after two years. So I was happy. Why did you get kicked out? Because it was a terrible fit. It's like not a good fit. Were you a drinker? No. Were you doing drugs? None of that. None of that. You just... Although everyone in high school said that I was, so that was great. The, the rumor is so I got what? kicked out because of cocaine use. I'm like, I didn't do it. I, so yeah. what did you do to get kicked out of Juilliard? Well, I liked some things and I didn't like other things. And I could apply myself to the things that I liked, mm. but I couldn't apply myself to the things that I didn't like. And and the other thing was, is that I hadn't really made a commitment of being an actor because I just didn't take it seriously. That didn't go over that well. Over but there. did you do enough in there that you learned enough to help you? Yes, I did. I've stolen their stuff, you know, shamelessly. Um, I think some of these uh, teachers would be uh, horrified to learn what I've used their training for. Um, <laughs> but here's the thing, you know, Juilliard, Glenn and I talk about this to this day. Glenn said, not a year ago, he said to me, and if this shows you that the people that went to Juilliard all share the same trauma, he said a year ago, he said, can you imagine what, how good the Juilliard School of Drama would be if they were interested in helping young people? And I was like, yeah, that'd be an incredible school, wouldn't it? It'd be something else. Because some of the teachers were incredible. They're like, for example, uh, there's a teacher named Ralph Zito, uh, voice and speech. He was unbelievably great and hard on you at times when you were messing around, but like just terrific. Richard Feldman, another one who could be oh, hard Dick on you. Dick Feldman. Oh, Dickie Feldman. Yep. Dickie Felds. Dickie Felds. Um, you know, and uh, you know, there were there were various teachers there that were wonderful. Uh Becca Guy was really sweet to me and and also hard on me. But then there were teachers there. Who hated you. Well, they hated everyone. I weirdly no one really got on my case, but I watched those, sometimes they did, and I watched those teachers really hammer mercilessly on some of the actors. So much so that like, I, I worked with Keith You've seen people cry? Oh yeah, all the time. Mm. It was traumatic. Did you traumatic. Ever cry? I never did because I never took it seriously. I was like, whatever, man, you guys are all trying to learn how to be actors. I don't know what I want to do for a living. Um, and that didn't go over well over there. You know what I mean? Um, you, have this, you have this innate confidence about you that... I think that's, I mean, that's what's gotten you. That and ta- obviously talent, but to have such a confidence is a big part of it. Huge. You don't seem like someone who really gets nervous before an audition. Who gets? Ner- is it? Has it changed? Do I, you get nervous now? Are you second guessing yourself? Are you? Uh, are you too hard on yourself? Do you get anxiety? What is it? Well, you know what's interesting, and you're. I think because I'm, I'm, you know watch your podcast and listen to it a lot so i you've talked about this type of thing always yeah and the thing is dude in this career you better accept that sometimes you're going to be the bellow of the ball you're going to be so important you're so important you're yeah, the lead yeah. of the blah, blah blah whatever and then the next week you can be nobody i mean maybe not next week but like you alternate from being someone to no one so you eventually so got to go it doesn't it doesn't fucking matter who cares who Doesn't cares? Matter. Who fucking cares? I get uncomfortable when when people oh walk the red carpet. I don't want to. I don't want to do. That. I, you know what? That's funny you said that. I uh, I remember my my manager and I was never good at this. Go. I want you to go to the Golden Globes. You need to be seen. I go. I don't have a project there. I don't want to go somewhere where I don't belong. No, a lot of actors go. I go. I am not that guy. I went to one Golden Globes and I just felt weird. Took my friend. It just, I always feel like nobody knows me. Who am I? What am I doing here? I don't belong. So I don't, I never did a lot of that. And it, yeah. it might've hurt me. He might've been right. Well, I need to do that. But a lot of people can do that. I, I'm not great at it. Here's the thing. Here's the thing. Your manager's totally right. Uh huh. He's totally right. But but you're the guy, again, there was, there was an episode of, of, of this where I was just, I, I, I was so happy you were talking about this. Because you were breaking open what the reality is, not the, your manager at that time, if he had learned that Michael Rosenbaum was going to say on a podcast, like, well, yeah, no, no, you're a big deal and you're the lead and then you're done and get to the back of the line. Yeah. That's not what you say if you're trying to sell the idea of like, this guy's a huge actor. He's the next big thing. Oh, he's really important. Yeah. You never, ever show that, you know, because that would be like showing weakness or vulnerability. Like, no, it's not a, vulnerability. That's what it is. And so you're encouraged to act like you're this big, important thing. But here's, here's my argument. By being honest, 
That's a different thing. And that is really appealing, I think, to be completely honest about what this business is. So I have a friend. I was tired of lying on myself Dude. for so many years. I just felt like, you know, I feel better. Just this is who I am. This is what I dealt with. This is, you know, hire me because I'm. you think I'm talented and I'm, and I'm, and I'm easy to work with. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, but go ahead. Yeah, but no, but that's the thing, man. Like, like there are people out there who that message is going to be far more useful to them Especially than the message now, of i think people dude, are opening up to to mental health and all that stuff and exactly. like hey we're human yeah yeah you know something uh that that you're okay when i was finally after juilliard after i got kicked out i had to make a decision whether i was going to pursue acting or not i'm like okay now i actually have to decide and i remember writing on aol because the internet was brand new. This is like 2000 or something like that. I wrote on uh, AOL uh, an actor named uh, Bruce Campbell. Do you know him? Uh, yeah, you know he's him? right behind you on yeah, the okay. poster. Yeah. 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 So, so I wrote Bruce Campbell. Wrote, Bruce Campbell wrote back. And the question was, how do you decide to be an actor? And, and he wrote back some of the most amazing advice. You still have it to this day? No, no, I don't, Bastard. unfortunately. But I remember what he wrote. He right. wrote, well, he's like a couple things. One, you make the decision and then you don't look back. I'm like, that's interesting. So he's saying, make a commitment, right? But then he said also, he's like, you know, and also don't expect that when you get the job that you're gonna be magically happy. Take the tools you have right now, and make yourself as happy as you can be. And I thought that was such a realistic yeah. human way of thinking about this stuff. Yeah, you know, it's funny. I had a conversation with Bruce not that long ago. We were smoking grass and riding bikes and he says, well, this is my third act. And I go, what? He goes, it's the final act it's the final in his life. Because he's, you know, at that age, he's like, this is it. I got to do what I want to do. This is the, my last chance to do what I want to do. Live on my terms. You know, not I'm not doing this kind of shit anymore. I'm not doing that. This is, and we talked about that. And it's like, you know, there are three acts. And I think, you know, um, I'm in my second act. And it's like, you know, the third act's coming up and I want to sort of get a hold on, you know, what I really want. I'm spending so much time trying to figure it out what it is I really want. What do you want? That, what do you want? Well, that's the question. It's I you know, look, it's the, it's the question that everybody, it's a, you know, it, it, it's, you know, some people get mad at me when I say this, but you know, it's the quest for, I want to say happiness. I want to say fulfillment content being content yeah. being um just enjoying what you're doing yeah. if you can um just trying to feel good every day try to feel good every day can and you, tell the people around me that i love them can i ask you a question yeah about that that's the the last part is wonderful i love that but can i ask you a question do you feel like do you feel like smallville and the success of that warped your ability to suss out what's going to make you happy and what isn't? I don't know. I don't, you know, I am certainly grateful. I always look at it as, you know, how many people in their lifetimes, even an actor, how many actors are there and what percentage of the world are actors? Right. I'm like, get to be on a hit show. Yeah. something that's universal that and you that could still lasts, go, so that people watch after you could gone. still go to cons and the fans are still there and it's yeah. like it, it stands the test of time i know one gets to do that no one so i always said if, if that's it and i do a bunch of other fun things great i think i just you know i'm glad smallville happened i mean i i was i went through some tough times where i i don't think i was happy at all but i think that stems from childhood i think mm -hmm. i just did, i wasn't working things out things weren't getting worked out so right. i would things would weigh so heavily on me where i felt just empty all the time and like not good enough and insatiable and uh and i didn't know why i had these things and until i started working on myself until i started understanding the connections the parallels and going oh that's why i do that that's what, and now that I understand that, I could sort of assess it and go, okay, why do you feel this way right now? You feel rejected or you feel this. Right. And and sort of figure it out and let it go more than I used to. And that's 
I'm finally, I finally feel like I'm sort of growing up. I fart and I do stupid shit, but I, I feel like I'm, I'm starting to grow up. Right. I'm starting to enjoy things. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's the, finally I got on the right meds. <laughs> I don't know, but, and that's true. I was just having a conversation with uh, a good buddy of mine who is a great actor. You know him. He was over the house last night. And he's like, yeah, you know, I just haven't myself for a couple of years. I, you know, my person I'm with, it's, you know, it's just not really, it hasn't been working. And I go, is it your fault? You think he goes, yes, it's my fault. And I don't know. I go, and we started talking. I go, listen, for the last four years, getting me out of bed wasn't easy. Mm -hmm. My dog was the reason I got out of bed. So I, cause I know that I had to take care of this pup Yeah, and I didn't leave the house a lot. My anxiety was through the roof up and down and this and that. I just, I was living a life that I, I couldn't live anymore. Mm -hmm. I really just, I go, there's gotta be. And I, I told them I spent two years, the last two years trying to find the right meds. Cause I felt like there was just something in my brain that would not allow me to, um, be motivated or enjoy things or you know it was just i was depressed i was i all these and people think you're depressed when you when you're just you know you're just constantly i don't want to do this i don't want i wasn't like that and i could fake it and people would think you're fine right and i said i really think you should consider seeing a, a psychiatrist and talk to him about these feelings because he hadn't and maybe there's some med an antidepressant that could change your life mm -hmm. and get, give you a boost to help you. Now, for me, I was never on antidepressants growing up, never on any anti-anxieties, never dealt with it. The funny thing is, I did dealt with it and I didn't know it. I didn't know all these things growing up were all anxieties. I was always in a perpetual state of anxiety, mm -hmm. constantly anxious about everything. And I didn't know that that was anxiety. This was de this was depression. You're down. You go and entertain people at a party and laugh and everybody loves you. And you go home and you're sad. Why? And until I got to talk to a professional and realized I need a little help, this, this was something that changed my life. And I said, I think this could change yours. Seek it out. Try it. And I think that's why I started opening up here on this podcast because I think being vulnerable and being real is I'm not lying to myself anymore. I'm going, you feel this way, talk to someone. You've got to talk to someone. Don't just let it build and build and and why why make yourself suffer? Right. So I don't know if that was the answer, but I just got on a tangent. No, no, no. It's it, because well, again, so it's, it's with, with what the world has been through recently sure we all got to be talking about this stuff and the thing is is I, I think it's useful for actors and stuff to talk about it because everyone thinks because we're constantly projecting hey we're not only is everything great with me but i'm special as hell and it's yeah. just perfect what, what, what's your next project oh, oh I'm, doing yeah, this yeah, thing. I'm doing this i'm writing this i'm doing this i'm making this i'm i'm working what about nothing how about not? just working on myself? Yeah. Just trying well, to be happy. Yeah. That's the thing. It's like, it's the thing that I try to tell people is it's like, listen, it's not, it's not what you think. And you're dealing with, especially you know, talk about mental health. People in our present profession deal with kind of astronomical, uh, amount of the word no and oh, yeah. disappointment sure. and all that stuff. And you almost have to just jettison any, for me, it's jettisoning the expectation that any anything should happen makes me happy. Yeah. Thinking about, you know, when they're like, what do you want to do next? Be like, how about this? How about I don't know and I don't want to know? Because if I start yeah. thinking about that, I'm going to start, it's going to drive me crazy. Oh, why did I get that? And oh, why did that person get that? And no, 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 fuck it. Fuck you know it, what I think it, it is a lot it. of times? When people say, what are you doing? What are you up to? You feel compelled to tell them. Puff up your chest. That I'm doing this. I'm this. I'm, 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 what's the word? I'm, um. Important? <laughs> well, I'm not, not important, but, um, what is it when you cast somebody, their worth, their, I am, imp I'm valuable. Valuable. Yeah. I'm valuable. See all the things that I'm doing? That's right. I'm valuable. And the reality is. And that's why I asked about the warped thing, because. Hitting that thing that you said, no one gets to do what we've gotten to do, right? And be the lead yeah. of a series and stuff like that, or, you know, or a series regular however many times or whatever it is. No one gets to do that. 
I have found there is a real mental health risk in that because you will eventually return to real life mm-hmm. and you're not going to have a publicity team that's constantly uh, you're rotating great, you're great. around you. You got a magazine thing. You got All this. Shit. All of a sudden it's gone. You're like, whoa. Uh, uh. If you start buying into, and thankfully I was always skeptical of that shit. I'm like, yeah. I don't buy into this. Don't think that this is this means anything. So so when when you know you get back to, to the back of the line, Thankfully, I had a, I had a I would leg up in terms of making that adjustment because I'm like, well, you never totally bought into that shit. Now you're learning you did a little bit though because it's bugging you. It's bugging you that you're not getting this or that someone isn't calling you for that, but it shouldn't. Yeah. Because fuck it. Because it's because it's it not these are goals that are not necessarily going to create happiness, especially no. dude series work, man. All you're doing is going to work. There is no personal life. Yeah, so how can you say that that, you know, like I was very happy doing being human, but I didn't have a personal life. No. Not at all. There was no time. And when you that. probably got really depressed when it was over each season. Right. Or and, when it was over for good. Well, it's, you know, and you 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 make that adjustment. So it warps your ability to sort of take these things in. Yeah. You know, um, it's funny. And this, I, I realized I, this happened from childhood is that I've never felt worthy. I've never felt like I'm go- When I was on Smallville, when I do shows, when I do movies or whatever I do, I'm always, it's it's weird. It's like, man, I, I nailed that. I did good and I did really well. I was, I, I, I'm, I'm really good. I, 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 ever, I, and then you're like expecting that everybody should notice that. And what a mistake that is. Or comparing oh yourself. And so what happens yeah. is, wow, I'm really good. They're giving me, I got this award. And then, you know, blah, blah, blah. But still nothing's changed. I'm yeah. not getting what I thought I would get. Right. I'm not getting the the publicity. They're not making me the priority. I've always felt like I've never been the priority. Hmm. And that always made me sort of, what's the word? It, uh, resentful. I always felt like, fuck, or jaded, like, I never get any fucking, you, the funny thing is, now that I'm working on myself and doing this, I've gotten more credit for like playing Lex Luthor or things than I, I never even, I never thought I was appreciated right. on all these projects from the studios, from anything. I always felt like I was this, the other guy, not the lead guy, not important. You're, yeah, we'll get you some publicity. I was always never important enough and I never should have looked at it like that. I should have been like, Dude, look what I'm doing. I because it all stems from not being good enough, not right. getting attention, all these things that I had to work on and 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 tell that little inner fucking child that these are great things and you should be proud of these yeah. things and nobody owes you anything. No. And 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 you no matter how great you think you yeah. are or want to be, it's not what's important. That's right. It's just it's just a, it's a lot it's a lot of shit. Well, you know and the, the whole thing of like, oh, it's going into the third act, that whole thing that yeah. Bruce was saying. And what do you want to do? You know, I have no answer to what I want to do at this point. And my reasoning is, I'm like, yeah, but I've already gotten to do so many things I want to do. So why don't I just go in not fucking knowing? I don't know. know, What do you want? What kind of role? Like even my managers, they get frustrated with me and rightfully so. They're like, what role? What do you want us to look for for you? I'm like, I don't know. I don't know. I, I got to do cool shit. And they're like, that's useless to us. But thank you for being (laughs) you. You're just kind of like. You're not trying as hard. No. You're not going, oh, I need this, I need this. You're like, well, because whatever. I, because you go through that, and then I'll be like, you know what makes me really happy is hanging out with my dogs. Because I feel like I have like, because I'm like, I'm like. And I'm, Ryan. And Ryan. Right. I like your dog too. I know. Wait, wait, I'm at Ryan and hanging out with Ryan. Huh. Well, I want to hang out with your dog though is what I'm saying. Yeah. Okay, cool. It, it brings me joy. And that honesty brings me <laughs> whatever. joy. Whatever. Yeah, you know what's funny? We haven't even got into go finish your. Oh, but so I was going to say, like, I have learned, like, the the life that makes me the happiest is far more simple than what it is that I was reaching for before. And thinking you know? that would make you happy, it's yeah. the little things holding your dog. Yeah, I love, it. and I got three of these guys. So, and and I live in, I've lived in Los Angeles now longer than I had the entire time that I'd been working as an actor because the lockdown and all that stuff but i mean you know i was constantly being transplanted to some other city for you know jobs and stuff like that i love being home and i love hanging out with my dogs That's and exactly that makes right. me really 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 happy um i hear you 
a million percent. Yeah. It's amazing how things have changed. Yeah. Things change, but you start feeling is important. My dog's important. Yeah. My feeding him, feeding her, making her happy, giving her the things she needs, giving her love, making love sure that. she's healthy. Look, we're almost like we're running out of time. But I gotta tell you, we didn't even talk about like Battlestar Galactica, mm -hmm. the whole season of season uh, eight of Smallville, Davis Bloom, uh, which we were well received, and you know they offered you a part in the next season to play, and you were like, no, the audience, it was for Doomsday. Uh, no, uh, it was for uh, uh, it was Doomsday in season eight, and then they wanted me to play Zod so, in season nine, yeah. and you're like, the audience won't believe it. I'm not doing it. Yeah, yeah. which is ballsy. It's, it's and by the way they didn't pay you a lot they kept you as a recurring no no, no. I had a you, series were you were main because i've never seen season eight because i left in seven yeah so now that we're doing talkville I had a series. i'm gonna see your whole performance oh, for the first jesus. time jesus well just know that that you were a major building block in that because oh i well no 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 because i had to study what you did to see what's possible on the show and i was like oh the answer is a lot the answer is you can do a lot on the show because you were going for it i mean i was and i i was just so i was paying special attention to your role not also because i knew that i had to do something different because so i'm like i can't and if i cover the same ground as rosenbaum performance wise um that's not gonna win well it's not you it's not me right and 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 he's already done it and he won he did it you know everyone loves that character so i've got to do something totally different so i but but watching what you did uh, was a huge thing that convinced me to do the, the job because they were sniffing around me for, I don't know why, but they were. So it was really a, do you want to do it or do you not want to do it? Mm -hmm. And watching your performance convinced me, no, I think I want to do it because you can look look what he did. Look what he did. So well, thank you. Yeah, um, well, and which is a good thing because that led to being human. Same casting director. And they were like, in, in, in Smallville, my character's kind of a monster who didn't want to be a monster. And being human is... A slightly more comedic version of that a vampire who doesn't want to be a vampire and the casting director eventually was like i think i know a guy who does this because <laughs> i had a lot of practice on smallville but just not the wow. funny wow so from your performance and that you got yeah. hey i didn't know is this true you mm -hmm. were engaged to allison mack <laughs> <laughs> oh god see this is the great thing about about rumors but this and the is all internet. This is all before all that shit happened. This oh, was yeah. like 14, 2014, 15. Yeah, so, so you know, so let me take you back to just before Supergirl. Um, TMZ runs this whole information about me and and that, 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 you know, I was engaged to her while that Nexium stuff was happening. So I started getting all these social so media- So you were like, engaged to her. Uh, according to TMZ. And so, <laughs> so I started getting all of this social media- harassment really what do you know what does Whitworth know what does he know you were you part of this is it, are your initials some i mean like awful awful stuff so i i contacted my publicity people i'm like this has to be squashed because if i'm anyone who's hiring people um they're not why would they want to deal with this why would they want to deal with all of this whether whether you know and, and i'm and they're like well so you weren't engaged i'm like i don't know the chick i worked with her but you the, never really knew her. No, 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 no. So here's the deal. The fans really liked our relationship on the show. Oh, so I was aware so that they... the fans were like, we think that they're actually dating in real life. And I'm like, oh, great. They're spreading rumors oh, about that, but whatever. No. Okay, fine. Then that story took on a life of its own. And the fans then decided, oh, not only are they dating, they just got engaged. And, and I'm like, what the Couldn't fuck? be further from the truth. Which is just a fucking invasive thing when people are making shit people up about do you. That which all happens people all said the I've dated. Time. Look, Michael's dating history and it's girls I've never heard of. Yeah. Never heard yeah, of a yeah, lot yeah. of them. Yeah. Candace, I was happy about Vampire Diaries. I said I dated this girl, Candace, um, mm. who is great. She's great in the show. We went on two dates or something. Yeah. We had a great time. She was awesome. That was it. Yeah, you were, we were engaged. Friends. You were engaged to her. That's what never. I heard. Yeah. Never no. engaged to anybody. An illegitimate child. With Let her. me ask you this. So, but really quick. So, yeah, so yeah. dude, I thought I, I had my pub uh, publicity team write TMZ and essentially say, hi, you didn't do your due diligence. This is going to harm Sam's ability to get work. And if you can't provide one fucking photograph of these two people in public, retract your goddamn story or we're, we're going to sue you. And TMZ then suddenly started issuing retractions and then the little sites issued retractions. And within mm. two weeks, I was hired for Supergirl. And I remember being like, guys, good thing we did that 
Because if this story, because it was getting bigger and bigger and you bigger and bigger. You never would have gotten the role. And, and it's not because they would have believed it. They would have been like, oh, there's too much it's, drama it's too around much here. Going too on. Much Whether drama. he did it or not, let's not deal with the drama. Yeah. Did you ever... Because it's like Superman, Supergirl, Allison Mack, this and that. Oh, this, you know, what you does know, Sam know? You like how my mind works? Get ready for this. Oh, my God. Did you ever kiss Allison off screen? No. Okay. Never. I just, just want to know. Never. Never. But by the way, it was a shock. It was a shock. Were you completely shocked when it all happened? You're like, what the Shit. hell? Shit. I think we were all just shocked. It was Jesus. a crazy, Jesus. crazy time. And, you know, um, you know, look, as people can say whatever they want about Allison, I knew her as really sweet. She was always good yeah. to me. She was always great at her job. She was a great actress. And um, I, I couldn't believe it. So I'll, that's all I'll say about that. Look, you've done so much. You're going to have to come back on. But Battlestar Galactic, Smallville, Being Human, Once Upon a Time, Supergirl, fourth season as the main antagonist, Riverdale, Dexter, The Mist with Frank Darabont. You also did a little Walking Dead playing a, a zombie. Uh, you did voice stuff on The Mandalorian, Star Wars, Star Killer, and Force Unleashed game series, Darth Maul, uh, Palpatine, and Clone Wars and Rebels. It's unbelievable. How? Why can't I get one audition for a damn Star Wars voice? Dude. Dude, it's so look, that was because a friend of mine. Uh, okay, so The Force Unleashed was a video game project, and George Lucas and the team there decided they're like, you know, I don't know how this happened, but at some point someone said, and let's pretend like it was George, right? So here goes, yeah. all right, you know what you should do for video games is uh, you should uh, you should hire That's uh, him. a guy who looks like the he doesn't just sound like the part, but he looks like the part, and you can we can use our ILM uh, uh technology to put him in the game. <laughs> that'd be interesting and <laughs> someone decided that the characters needed to be played by people who looked and felt like him and that the way that the character would walk and everything would be dictated by the actor which was not done in video games back in 2007 so uh my buddy says you got to send me your headshot and you're real and then he slipped it into the pile and i happened to look like how they wanted the character to look you know they they uh, this artist created this piece of art that looked somewhat like me and then they, the, the headshot looked like what they wanted to look like. Then I came in for an audition and that's when me being a Star Wars nerd helped because there was a scene we were doing and the character's supposed to start in the scene meditating, assembling his lightsaber with the force. And he's meditating and then he comes out of the meditation and has the scene. And I did the scene different every time, but the meditation, I always did it really tense. Like, you know, it was like, just balled up in fists of fury and white knuckles. And, and, and after a while, the director's like, you know, we've done this scene four times and you've done it different. But the meditation, why are you playing it so tense? The meditation, you're so you're so tense in the meditation. And I said, he doesn't know how to meditate. And the director's like, what? He's a Sith. He thinks this is how you do it. And you force the pieces together because it's the this is my job. You, the force belongs to me. So I was like, Vader would never have taught him how to find inner peace. He would have taught him to do the opposite. And when I did that, I saw a bunch of Lucasfilm people behind this glass wall at the studio and they were all starting to look at me and talk about and they were like, wait wait what the you know what's he doing and i was told that was when i got hired for force unleashed they're like the moment you geeked out on what the sith would have taught is when you got the role wow. and then because of force unleashed dave filoni hired me for clone wars which is where my voiceover career began basically how many episodes of clone wars did you do i can't remember it was something around 11 or something like that. but what the, the thing is whenever i was in it it was a big deal they always made a big deal about it so it feels like i'm in the show more than i i was but, but basically it started with this character called the son of mortis who they were like you want to do clone wars i'm like yeah sure and they're like it's a really cool role i'm like i just already said yes you don't have to say that you know whatever <laughs> and then eventually i find out that you're like no you're playing the dark side of the force there's this, this dream world and anakin and obi-wan and ahsoka are in this dream world and they meet this character named the sun and we're, the audience is going to it's going to dawn on them that this is actually the voice of the dark side just trying to turn to turn everyone you know and and manipulate events and so i did that and then after that me and dave became friends because we were nerding out he just on kept stuff. hiring you and then eventually he was like hey so you know you got some friends in uh, lucasfilm i'm doing my dave impression now yeah i got some friends in lucasfilm so you probably know we're going to bring darth maul back i'm like yeah i've heard and he's like what do you think about that? I'm like, I don't know about that, dude. I don't know if that's a good idea. He's like, okay, well, we got it. Maybe we got something for you in the future. So thanks for coming in and see you later. Like, I'm Whoa. Like, oh, and I didn't make the, I'm like, oh, so I'm going to play a bounty hunter. He's like, uh, yeah. And you haven't been listening to the conversation. Okay, cool. Cool. See you later. See you later. I had no idea. So he calls me a year later and he's like, so I need Darth Maul. Can you do it? And I'm like, what? 
give me your best Darth Maul. Well, so Darth Maul from The Phantom Menace by was voiced by Peter Serafinowicz. And he was very, at last we will reveal ourselves to the Jedi. At last we will have revenge. So I had to use that voice as the building block to create my Darth Maul, which has elements of both, but it goes in its own direction, you see. You know, and so... Wow. Um, um, so it had, to, it had to have the sense of Peter Serafinowicz, like that being the younger version of the character, but eventually he... The, the the voice takes on a voice of its own and and um and so dave That's and awesome. i i mean juilliard dude, that the, helped well right and what's hilarious is that me and ralph Cito, my juilliard voice and speech guru would make star wars jokes all the time so i would say emperor zito he's like yes mr Whitwer, i am your emperor now make the vowel sounds correctly this time you know and it was that's what we would do. Gosh. So now, you know, now I, want, I wish I could bump into him and be like, I have learned to use my voice in unnatural ways. That's Palpatine. Is it possible to learn this power, Mr. Whitwer? Not from a Jedi. You know, so. That is perfect. So. Good so, Lord. So the Star Wars thing has been really fun. The Maul character, we have done now what feels like countless hours of that They don't character. pay well. Huh. You know what's hilarious about that? What? They, the thing I've learned about Lucasfilm, and it's t true today as it was back in the independent, when it was an independent studio days, they're very loyalty based. They're so. so they don't pay a lot, but they bring you back, my back, back. God, they're, they're like, if you ever ask them for a favor, they're just like, what can we do? You know, oh, can I, you know, can I do some stuff for my album at Skywalker Ranch? Like, yeah, we'll set it up. Are you serious? Oh, crazy stuff. They they treat me so well. And my managers have now realized, like, guys, it is, you realize if Lucasfilm asks us for anything, just say yes, because they're sweethearts. And they, and they, and they, unlike other people where they say, oh, it'd be a great favor if you did this. They don't remember favors in this <laughs> business. They don't care. They're trying to get right. you to do something. Lucasfilm, actually, if they say, could you do us a favor? They remember that you did that for them, right? So, so yes, no one got animated series, as you know, people get paid scale, right? Right, right, right. But Lucasfilm does this wonderful thing where they're like, oh, you know, Darth Maul is uh, in this brisk iced tea commercial. I'm like, oh, what? Cool. cool. Do you think that they're like, oh, no, 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 don't worry. The license basically says they have to use who we say they use. And they're using you. So have fun making a bunch of money on that. You know, I mean, they're. So there you go, make another 10, 20 grand. Dude, that brisk commercial was more than that, my friend. That was it, probably the most money I'd ever made for the time that I put in. It was like no time at all, and it was insane. So Lucasfilm takes care of people. They, well, I wish they'd take care of me. They're, <laughs> they're awesome, man. The, and I'd I'll do tell it for you, free. I'd I'll, be a stormtrooper for free. You know what's funny is I've, I've asked, I remember asking a Lucasfilm producer, I'm like, why have you guys hired me every year for 15 years? I mean, I've been underfoot all the time. Because you're good. Constantly, well, they were sweet and said that, but they said, I'm like, I'm con they're like, because you stay out of our way, Sam. I'm like, what do you mean? I'm like, I'm constantly bugging you guys. Oh, what's going on with this? What's going on with that? Oh, who's so-and-so? And he's like, yeah, you're always asking about plot points. You're never asking for a job. You're always asking what's happening with, you know, Nerd. the Mandalorian. Nerd. What's, what's, go what's R2-D2 thinking it. at this point? You know what I mean? Like, they're like, your questions are always nerd-based, but you never, ever ask us for a job. You stay out of our way. So oh, yeah. they're like, be easy to work with. Yeah. They, they, they have a very chill mentality over there where someone who's pumping himself up and trying to look at what you're talking about. I'm so important. They don't mm. like that. No, they actually like who it. Does? It was like, who does, what did George Lucas do? He's like, you know, he's going in for a rehearsal They're not, no, no, like a, he's reading people for Han Solo and, uh, he's uh, going in and, uh, oh, Harrison, what are you doing here? Oh, hey, George, I'm just trying to build a trellis here for, uh, you know, the studio. Oh, that's great. Anyway, good to see you, Harrison. It was great to see you. Uh, hey, you know, Harrison's working on your uh, trellis. Yeah, yeah, he is. He was great in American Graffiti. Uh, we need a reader for these, and we're, we're short one hand solo. Uh, let's just have Harrison. Do you think, Har hey, Harrison. Yo, George. Do you want to read, uh, uh, can you do the reader for this? Uh yeah fuck it okay and then he's on solo you sound exactly like harrison ford no one does harrison well, ford there's there's okay there's there's young harrison ford han solo i'm captain of the millennium falcon chewie here tells me you're looking for passage to the alderaan system then there's then there's a grumpy harrison ford he doesn't give a fuck about anything but you know the thing is is he's actually kind of a teddy bear because he gave 
key, a big hug because of everything everywhere all at once. This short round is <laughs> you're going to teach back. me how to do this. It's you know. Here's the cool thing about all the voice stuff that I've been given over the years is that it, it you necessarily have to learn how to use your voice in different ways. And so as a on camera actor, I now know how to do that job differently, you know, which is fun. It's Your really way. I mean, all right, this is called Shit Talking with Sam Whitworth. Shit These are my top tier patrons. This is rapid fire. Do it. You got to answer quickly. All this right. is um, <clears throat> my top tier patrons. Uh, they save the show. The patrons in general save the show. Go to inside of you. <laughs> dot com slash no patreon.com slash inside of you join support the show we need you med k being human was and still is one of my favorite shows as a cast you guys had chemistry that is so rare and could you tell you could tell that all of you not only got along off camera but genuinely liked each other as well i'd love to know if you had a favorite storyline or least favorite storyline from the show rapid fire favorite storyline um was uh basically all of it, except and I wasn't crazy about season two. That would be my least favorite storyline. I felt like we got too gothy. And I'm like, no, it's being human. Put him with people. And that's the comedy is my character is just, he's like this mysterious vampire and this and that. And then he has to deal with being at a grocery store and weird, funny shit that's, happens. That sounded like Jeff Goldblum a little bit. Really? Oh, do I again. Do, 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 can you do, do a Jeff no, Goldblum? No, do that again. All right, here's my character is, a, a, so if I- So if you do that and you start stuttering a little more, um, well, you could- Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm, oh, yeah, hey, Mr. You, Jeff you work Goldblum, on that, it's close. On, all, right. all right, yeah, yeah. All right, Angela F., what was the most challenging part of filming being human? The long, long days. days. Getting my ass kicked day in. Oh, you know, some of those bruises you see in the show, they were real. They didn't have to put bruises on me because I already had them in the appropriate spots. So Bruce Campbell over there. Yeah. Dev Nixon, Sam, you said once you like science fiction with class. So for you, what are the key ingredients to classify it as much? <laughs> if it's about something, has to be about something. You can't just do a science fiction story. It's going to be like, no, 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 we're doing what it feels like to be, um, you know, someone who has been broken up with oh we're doing a story about how you find your way in the world we're doing it's always got to be about oh we're doing a story about drug addiction it's got to be about something if you can do that i and, like that. i mean notice that i'm taking on kind of a shatner thing shatner it's got to be about something michelle i know you're a huge star wars nerd who is your all-time favorite character and why luke skywalker do you do Luke Skywalker impression? Oh, I don't. No, no, that's no, no, hard, no. Right? That's, that's a tough one. That's a tough one. He does the he does everyone's voices, but no one can do his. Leanne, voice. did you read any of the Archie comics before appearing in Riverdale? I did not. I did not, and nor did I know what I was doing on Riverdale. Joshua D, if you could only do one live action role between Star Killer from The Force Unleashed or Deacon St. John from Days Gone, which one would you choose and why? Son of a bitch. Um Deacon basically was a live action role. He, you know, they basically shot us on a mocap stage. So that was all on camera. Star Killer, the mocap wasn't quite up to snuff at that point technologically. So I'd love to go back to Star Killer and and show what we were doing more because right. the performance only came through partially. So what are you doing now? <laughs> <laughs> hilarious yeah. no, uh, no 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 i'm just kidding no, yeah, i'll do a little bit you know what they, if you're doing something plug it lucasfilm and what's your handle on instagram uh s witwer one on instagram okay um but i'm gonna say this i yesterday they aired an episode where i got to voice general kale on willow and that was fun fuck you general kale played by pat roach pat roach you know who pat roach is right no Dude, see that guy next to you? That dude right Harrison there? Harrison Ford? Yeah, 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 yeah. He, he, Pat Roach is like the Indy. boss battle in Indiana Jones about four different times. I think actually one was cut. But you remember uh, Temple of Doom? The big guy yeah. on the oh, conveyor yeah. belt? Yeah. The big dude who's punching the That's hell out him? of him? Pat Roach. Remember the Nazi, the bald guy who fights him on the flying wing? Yeah. That's Pat Roach. Remember the guy- He died, right? Yeah, he's no longer with us, unfortunately. But do you remember also the guy who fought Indy in the Marion Marion Ravenwood bar when it's on fire? And yes, the big the fire. yes. Yeah, boom, that's Pat Roach. Um, he's all over the place, and they just make him look different, and you just never recognize him. But he's you know he's the damn Nazi who the bald guy with the big you know oh, come here, come here, you know. And beats last the thing, up. last thing, one by one, quickly do as many impressions as you can, saying the name and then doing it. You did Harrison Ford. All right. All right. Harry, All right here Harry. we go. Harrison Ford is here uh, talking to you. There's a good friend of mine over here. Well, that's right. It's Morgan Freeman. Hey, I just want to say that Michael Rosenbaum's podcast gives me great peace of mind. Pretty good. And to do frame. 
And then, of course, there's one that you do, which is this guy, and he sometimes talks like this. But you actually worked with him, so what the fuck am I doing? <laughs> but this is a great thing, because the thing is that, that you can do your Arnold Schwarzenegger, you know, and you can do it, and you can, come on, do it, kill me, I'm here, do it now. But the thing is, is that my friend uh, Glenn Howerton told me that my Schwarzenegger became better the more smug I got. That's right, you idiot. <laughs> <laughs> Let wow. me tell you something about, can you imagine what it's like to be me six times Mr. Olympia, right? Lou, you're doing great. I mean, you're never going to be quite the best, but you'll be second best and that's great. But also listen to me here because I just, I can't lose. I love it. Right? That. Wow. It's, uh, it does it. So do it, come on. Um, uh, Crazy. The FBI is going to pay me to learn how to surf. That's Keanu Reeves. I know exactly uh, what that is. <laughs> that's, um, and then, yeah, um, point break. Um, prequel Palpatine. Every single Jedi is now an enemy of the Republic. Return of the Jedi, uh, Palpatine. Everything that has transpired has done so according to my design. Your friends up there on the sanctuary moon are walking into a trap, as is your rebel fleet. Um, you know what? In the morning, and this is what I'm working on, so it's not going to be good because it ha it's only works the first thing in the morning, but I'm going to try to do it right now. Because in the morning, I have very deep tones, which I don't exactly have, but I've learned how to do in the morning a passable James Earl Jones. <laughs> you broke into my house, stole my property, murdered my servants and my pets. And that is what grieves me the most. I'm working on it. That's pretty good. That's right Get on the it. cusp. It's not there yet. It's not there yet. But why not show what I'm working on? You know, they, I'm trying to think like, you're sitting here uh, about to fall over every night from uh, uh, learning to do the voice of James Earl Jones. So I know I'm trying to get there. I'm trying to get there. Um, That's awesome, dude. That's a, awesome. I do a bad Shatner. I do a bad whole bunch of guys. Well, that was so. that was freaking plenty. Oh, that was amazing. <laughs> this has been an absolute joy. Did you have fun? Yeah, dude. It just was two dudes talking. It's just two dudes talking. I just dropped something. Uh oh. The part of Indiana Jones fell off. God, I've got to learn how gone. to do an Indiana Jones. I got to learn how to do that. I've got to learn how to do that. You what do just, you do? What do you do? Well, you just sort of. Well, here's you the thing. You see, sort of, he actually went to high school about two miles school. from my house in two Chicago. Miles from my house so there's the Chicago thing that he's got going on. So this Chicago, is a little bit of a Chicago. I got a friend who's a friend buddy who so. sort of talks like this a little bit. So he's already halfway there. But the whole he's thing. Halfway there. And then when he gets excited, excited. you know, you open it's up hard. the voice a little bit. You um. You know, what you did is you took the staff at a certain place, at a certain... Nah, see, I'm losing it now. Hold on, hold on, hold on. 3PO. What is it? Not entirely stable. I'm glad you're here to tell us these things. Shut up. Uh, what is it? Chewie, take the professor in the back and plug him into the hyperdrive. You know, that whole thing. <laughs> oh. Short round. Yeah, that was... what it, He has those, low, those yelling lines, right? Like, you know... Oh, my God. I could listen to this forever. Shorty. Yeah. yeah, you're going to teach me that. All right. This has been an absolute treat. Thank you for allowing me to be inside of you. Yes. Uh, I would love to do this again with you sometime. You have you have so much to talk about. We didn't even get into any of it, half of it. Yeah. But it was just life. It's life stuff. It, it, sometimes you've got to do life. you <laughs> yes. got to talk. I, was, I appreciate that you have, that you know about the deep walking. Because people just stay up here. That's what I always say. you got to get to the deep walking because that's when he really. Well, also he can be subtle. He's like, your son Fuck it, it is. That bitch or girlfriend, it took my narcotics. Now, I know you know where they are. There it is, there it so, is. So tell me before I do damage you won't walk away from. He does like little things, but I don't know. It's well, there's, there's an area in the voice that is that you can really, if you key into Clowns. it. Clowns. Clowns. That's right, the down here. Down here. Down here. Down here you know, yeah, where, where, where Liam Neeson's voice exists. <laughs> Yeah, you go down here on your channel. This your next voice. part is going to be very difficult. That's right. They're going to take you. <laughs> I have a particular set of skills. We can do this all day. We love you. Yeah. I love you. Yeah. Thanks, man. <laughs> awesome, man. I liked him. I, you know, it's funny because uh, we've talked about having him on the podcast for a while, and I've talked to him. He's like, "When am I coming on?" When I, and I kind of lost touch. And then I'm like, "People have been asking about him," mm -hmm. and he's a really great guest. He was really fun. 
He was knowledgeable. He has done so much work. He has a good spirit about him and some great stories. And I, and I thank you, Sammy. Thanks for coming on the podcast, man. I really enjoyed it. Um, and of course, just, uh, hopefully you guys will stick around and, um, listen to every episode and subscribe, subscribe to every episode. Subscribe. Thanks for being here, Ryan. Let's subscribe. get the, uh, top tier patrons. Yeah, let's just do it. All right, Nancy D, Leah S, Sarah V, Little D, C, U, Kiko, G, L, E, Brian H, Nico P, Robert P, Jason W, Sophie M, Kristen K, Raj C, Raj C, Joshua D, Jennifer N, Stacy L, Jamal F, Janelle B, Mike E, Eldon, Supremo, 99 more, Santiago M, Chad W, Leanne P, Janine R, Maya, P, Maddie S, Belinda N, Dave N, what? Dave H. Correct. Dick Hasselhoff. But not David Hasselhoff, Dave Hasselhoff, Dave H. Hall, Sheila G, Brad D, Ray H, Tabitha T, Tom N, Liliana A, Talia M, Betsy D, Chad L, Dan N, Big Stevie W, Angel M, Rhiannon C, Corey K, Deb Nexon, Michelle A, Jeremy C, Brandy D, Camille S, Joni B, Joey M, Eugene and Leah, Corey, Heather L, Jake B, Megan T, Angela F, Mel S, Orlando C, Caroline R, Christine S, Eric A, Shane R, MLR, Andrew M, Zedoe G77. Andreas N, Oracle, Karina N, Amanda R, Jen B, Kevin E, Stephanie K, Jarrell, Billy S, Jam and J, Leanne J, Luna R, Cindy E, Mike F, Stone H, Stone, Miss S, Brian L, Katie B, Aaron R, Kendall L, House J, Meredith I, Charlene C, and Kara C. Thank you guys from the bottom of my heart for being patrons and supporting the podcast. Some of you have been here for years and, uh, you know, I always feel bad. I'm like, am I giving enough merch uh, when I give my boxes and I try to make a personalized note and I hope you're enjoying it all and you stick around and thank you. Um, thank you so much for uh, being here. And, uh, you know, we don't talk that much, you know, usually there's a lot of shows, I guess, that really talk in the beginning about things that happen. I guess if something happened, you and I would talk about it, right? Yeah. But you know, nothing major has happened. Yeah. So there you have it. We love you. Um, uh, from the Hollywood Hills in Hollywood, California, I'm Michael Rosenbaum. I'm Ryan Davis. I'm also here. Yes. Hi, guys. Okay. We love you. Okay. We do. We love you. Thank you. And um, always, Ryan, what, what do we say? Uh, always? N- no. No. Be good to yourself. Take care of yourself. Take care of yourself. Be good to yourself. That's the one. That's it. We'll see you. Hold on to Smallville, too. Yeah, that too. <laughs>